well then welcome everybody for tonight's or two tonight's uh we are legendary almost <laughs> legendary geo talk uh we started these talks a long time ago and um yeah and here we are again and i would like to welcome our special guest uh jeff and jeff is our weather guy and he will introduce himself certainly um uh, himself, because I I know that there is lots more that you can tell us and you can let us know who you are, what your career was and all that kind of stuff. And then we will talk about the weather and how it ties into geoengineering and what is what is true, what is not true, what is it what we can see and what, what is it we cannot see, right? <laughs> and we'll talk about the clouds as well. Okay, so there you go. Um, the floor is yours. Um, Please go ahead. We can't hear you, Jeff. Okay. That's test, now test. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should I share my screen off the start or yeah? Ready yes. for that? I'm totally. So Jeff's got a presentation about the clouds. So um, I, yeah, that's, this is what we're, what we're gonna present. And yeah, please feel free. So I will make you co-host and then you are good to go. One second. Uh, there you go. Okay. All right, let's see. I should get this guy minimized here and okay. So yeah, my name is Jeff and I was a Navy meteorologist, what they called the aerographer's mate. Uh, back in the Navy uh, quite a long time ago, and um, I still do it as a hobby, but um, I, oh, I'm sorry, one second, please. Everything okay? I'm, 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 I'm being, okay. I'm sorry, Bettina. My well went out and my neighbor is repairing it, and I'm kind of is distracted with that right now. So get back to this here, get my mindset back. Um, yeah, I was the aerographer's mate, put in eight years, was the weather observer and forecaster for the last three. Um, brief pilots on uh, their flights issued the weather forecast for the, for the Naval Air Station that I was stationed at. And it, I decided not to go back to college for it, kind of regretful, but um, I still do it as a hobby. And about a year and a half ago, I kind of got um, a, a group of friends mentioned that Renette had a group called Save Our Skies. And I got back into it then to analyze contrails. So that's where I started. And I've been kind of inching my way back in got into the cloud seeding study of aircraft. Um, mainly I spent my first several months um, using something called the skew T log P diagram, which is uh, what they use for a, a radius on. Uh, they launch the weather balloons like twice a day across the globe at uh, a certain time of day and they do it simultaneously. I take all that data and put it put it to use onto maps, and that is the basis for your weather forecasting. More so than even the surface observations from the Surface Observer Network. So today, I, don't, I know there was a nice big event, not such a nice one up in Calgary. That's one thing that we could put some time into today. We can look at the aircraft that were involved with that event. Uh, look at the cloud seeding part. Um, as far as really good zones of um, contrails today, I looked earlier this morning. I had I did not see any. So I mean that's something that we could take a, a peek at if anybody desires, as well, and see if we could find any anywhere. But as of this morning, it wasn't such a great day for contrails anywhere. No ISSRs which is your ice super saturated regions. So Bettina, I think we should, what do, would you like to just have anybody ask any questions off the start? What anybody wants to get into or um, is there already questions? Uh, then I'll feel free 
to to ask those questions or did you want to just wait for the presentation and then uh and then ask your questions i think that's that's the way to go okay okay so i got to find my okay cloud identification so this is jeff we cannot see your screen yet you can't see the screen nope Oh, yeah. I thought I I thought I shared that. I'm sorry. Um, Zoom. Darn it! I lost your I lost your screen. I'm showing my ineptness at the computer here at this moment. Usually uh, on, the, on the taskbar on the bottom, you're on an Apple as well. On the taskbar on the bottom, there is a blue icon. It reads Zoom. So when you click on that, then it should open up the, the Zoom uh, screen again. Okay. Um. There you go. Okay. So this is the, um, if we're gonna start out with clouds, I'm just gonna really briefly go through this. This is the presentation that I did with Stella, uh, clouds part one. And uh, this is the basis for weather, of course. If you don't have the clouds, you don't have weather. So there are, 27 types of clouds at a minimum that are in the uh, International Cloud Atlas. And so here is a little diagram that we have that talks about the main types, the cloud types. This is a um, a little handout called what's this cloud and your cloud types are off to the left and there's classified as three different levels you have the low level you have the mid level and you have the upper level where the cirrus is so down in your lower level you have cumulonimbus cumulus stratus and stratocumulus so your cumulus are your little puffy ones your stratus is a sheet-like layer, like when you're on the west coast of a uh, place like San Francisco, you just have like a, a fog layer. Stratocumulus, which is uh, a, a cumulus that flattens out into a sheet. Then you get your big cumulonimbus, which is your founder head. That actually encompasses from down low all the way up into the high uh, cloud layer. And then you have your mid-level clouds, alta cumulus, alta stratus, and nimbostratus. Alta cumulus is a puffy type of a cloud. Alta stratus is a sheet-like, similar to stratus. And then uh, you have uh, nimbostratus, which is not showing here. Let's see, because, oops. Nemostratus reaches down. Hmm. I don't think you can see it. There we go. Um, Nemostratus starts from low and comes up into the middle area. And then you have your um, cirriform clouds, your mare's tails, your cirrus clouds, and then cirrocumulus, which is a bumpy type of a cloud, and then uh, cirrostratus, which is a sheet like cloud that's high and white. So typically you have under 6,000, 7,000 feet would be your low clouds, your mid clouds run up to about 15,000 and then above 15,000 is where your high clouds start. So that's just a quick and easy manual or uh, what's this cloud is the name of the website. But 
what you really get into for identifying clouds is the International Cloud Atlas. Atlas. And there are special coatings for clouds uh, by the weather observers. They code it into the um, observations that they take every hour. It's not coded every hour, but it is coded periodically. So there's a network of, of, of uh, weather observers throughout the world, and they all take observations at like five minutes to the hour. And then your weather maps are built off of that. And then the forecasters and computers analyze the weather maps and input that data and make something of a forecast out of that. So just very quickly, I'm just gonna quickly briefly go through each of these cloud types. So this is done in really good detail on the um, video that we did with, uh, with Stella. So cumulus, puffy low clouds, as they get bigger, that's called a low cloud type, type two. And the names are lifted, lists off to the left. Um, they get deeper. In, in height, then you get into more massive clouds that reach up into the upper troposphere. Then you have a low cloud type four, which is a stratocumulus. You have these low clouds rising up and hitting a stable layer and spreading out. And then you have a different type of uh, hey. low cloud. What was that? Okay. So this is a stratocumulus not resulting from the spreading out of the cumulus. Then you have stratus fractus, which is your foggy type cloud that you would see at San Francisco or um, west coast of continents. And then you have uh, stratus fractus or cumulus fractus associated with wet weather. Cumulus and stratocumulus at bases at different levels. Here you can see on the right picture, uh, a low cumulus with the stratocumulus above that. And then you have a cumulonimbus, which uh, frequently has an anvil top. When it hits the troposphere, it spreads out. Mm. So those are your nine low cloud types, the basic types. And then you have varieties within that. So then you get into your mid clouds. Alta stratus is, it's transparent enough where you can't see the sun or moon through it. You might see the outline of it slightly, but uh, it's too thick to see the actual uh, shape of it. Jeff, can I just it, quickly interrupt and ask a question? So the low clouds, yeah. you mentioned the troposphere. So these clouds are strictly and only in the stratus and in the, in the troposphere? Yes. So I should go back really quickly. I'm going to go back to uh, an earlier slide that I, I breathed through. Um, this is your atmosphere right here. So, so you have the troposphere and the dividing line between the troposphere and the stratosphere is the tropopause. Then you have the stratopause, the mesosphere, mesopause, thermosphere, thermopause, and exosphere. And these two are frequently called the ionosphere, up where the space shuttle and the aurora and the satellites are. So all the clouds are in the troposphere. The only time that changes is like if you have a severe thunderstorm that punches through. It has a lot of vertical velocity. And if you have a really strong thunderstorm, it can push through up into the lower stratosphere a bit before it stabilizes and then it can't go any further. The other type of event that would do that would be like a Hunga Tonga event that happened back in January of uh, 2022. And that one pushed up into the mesosphere. It busted through the troposphere, through the tro stratosphere and up into the mesosphere. It takes a, a violent explosion like that to do that. So clouds are in the troposphere. That's where we live and breathe. and you have a number of aircraft that fly in the stratosphere, like all your business jets. If I went on flight radar right now, I could probably find 50 business jets above, above the stratosphere at this moment. And 
not too many um, cargo jets, not too many passenger jets get up there. So it's it's a fairly minimal number relative to all the flights that get into the atmosphere, up into the stratosphere. Yep, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after you have your, your nine low cloud types, you have your altostratus and nimbostratus. Nimbostratus is the steady rain producer, completely masks the sun or moon. Then you have your altocumulus. This is a, like humans, we have homo sapiens. Clouds have a genus and a species. This is a species of translucidus at a single level. So they're kind of lined up in a, probably perpendicular to the, the uh, range of, of hills that are around there, very likely. Mid-type 4 is also altocumulus, but it's continually changing shape, and it includes the lenticular clouds that you see, the spaceship-type looking clouds that are over mountains. And then you have bands invading, in what you call progressively invading the sky. So you have bands of clouds and they continuously uh, become more numerous as they're coming from the horizon. That's mm -hmm. a mid-cloud mid type five. Mid-cloud type six result in spreading out of the cumulus that has reached a stable layer arresting vertical development. So you could see their cumulus clouds below reaching up into that uh, mid-cloud range above 7,000 feet up to about 15,000 and it spreads out there and that's called the alto cumulus. And then you have a mid cloud type seven, it's not invading the sky. So you have a certain amount that's moving across the sky but not becoming a larger percentage as it's doing that. And with uh, mid cloud type eight, they call it Castellanus because you can see it has like, um, looks like ponds or rooks or something like that, chess pieces sitting at the top. You get these protuberances going upward that indicates instability. Mm -hmm. And you have a catch-all. When you have a chaotic sky, you call it a nine. Uh, Mid-cloud altocumulus of a chaotic sky at multiple levels. So then you have your interior high clouds, your cirrus, Encinus or Cirrus fibrous, not progressively invading. These are the beautiful, they call them mare's tails sometimes, not invading the sky. High two is a slightly different type. Uh, Spisatus, Castellanus, or Flaccus, not increasing in coverage. Then you get into the three, you have to have evidence of a cumulonimbus cloud. In this case, you can see the low cloud cumulonimbus thunderhead type. And then it hits the tropos, the tropopause and it spreads out. So as long as you have that, um, you could say that this guy was also from one of those. That's a high type three. Type four, now you're getting into when it's progressively invading the sky. So they're becoming more numerous as they come in and they start to thicken and move in towards you. Type five is when they're less than 45 degrees and invading. And then after they reach 45 degrees or more, still invading, that's the type six. So more than 45 degrees up is covered with that type of cloud. Type seven is the one you see with the halo that's covering the whole sky, Cirrus stratus. And then you have a type eight not progressively invading, not covering the whole sky. You can see the halo in this case, but there's probably one tenth of coverage that's not completely covered. And then you have cirrocumulus as your last type. That's the last of the 27 types of major types of clouds. And cumulus indicates that there's bumpiness, that there's an unstable layer that makes the clouds go from flat to bumpy. So, before I go on any further, I uh, want to ask for any questions, if anybody has any. That was really brief, but uh, gives you an overview. So I have a question. So if you, wanted, if you wanted to do some cloud seeding, what kind of clouds would you be looking for? 
you'd be looking for, there's a specific temperature range for, for silver iodide. So you would want to go to um, some way to assess the temperature and minus 10 is that, that beautiful number that they like. So what I would do would go to an app like VentuSky. Uh -huh. I'll, show you, I'll show you that real quick. So uh, the altitude depends on the temperature. So I go to VentuSky's this app and I'm gonna start looking through these levels. They give uh, multiple levels throughout here. And I would start at like 10,000 feet in the winter time in the mid latitudes. And right now over Calgary, I was looking at Calgary earlier because of the event that just happened. It's four degrees Celsius. So you would not see it at that level. You would look higher where it's colder. So in this case, I'm gonna say 18,000 because that's where I know it was over Calgary, minus 12. So slightly below 18,000 feet is where you would be putting your aircraft and doing your loops and circles. So part of that equation is, is there a deep layer of moisture down below you? So that's where you would have to go to something like a radius on data. Like in this case, this is Edmonton. So in this case, without getting into the um, what these, well, I'll just tell you very briefly. This red line is the temperature. The, uh, Jeff, can I quickly interrupt? Uh, is yeah. this still in your presentation or did you have another window open on your computer? Because we can still see your presentation. Oh, shoot. Okay. I only have it open to the other window. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> happens. <laughs> Okay, let me get back down to, let's see, I need to go to. Um, We're working on that. <laughs> I recognize you, that's Stella. Hello. Stella's trying to teach me all this stuff. <laughs> You're getting there. Okay. Uh, do I need to stop the video here and yeah. switch to a different screen probably? No? No, you just need to minimize your uh, presentation probably. You're in Keynote at the moment, so you need to get back to your browser. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you guys are seeing Keynote because that's what I opened it up to. Correct. But or you can I share your whole find... screen rather than each app. Your screen sharing. Jeez. <laughs> Stop share. Got to go back to uh, whiteboard. Firefox, Windy, okay. Okay, how's that? Beautiful. Yeah, good. Okay, so let me quickly go back to Venture Sky because I was trying to show you that minus 12 is what the temperature is at 18,000 feet. When you got the drop down over here for temperature on Venture Sky, I'm looking at these levels and looking for minus 10 degrees. So. 14,000 was, um, waiting for that to change, 14,000 is minus three, so they have to go higher. 500 millibars is the pressure level. That's the atmospheric pressure in uh, millibars or micropascals. It's minus 12, so you'd want to go Hec at 17,000 feet or so. Excuse yes. me, Jeff. Hec hectopascals. Hectopascals. Did I say micro again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so about 17,000 feet, 18,000 feet, based on that temperature alone. So you'd have to have clouds there and below, and you want to have a thick layer of clouds. So you would have to go to the radius on data. And this red line is the temperature curve. That radius on is the instrument that gets taken up by the weather balloon and it measures temperature and humidity all the way up. The blue line is a representative of the humidity. The red line is your air temperature. So when those two are very close together, like less than five degrees, you can figure there's clouds. So that tells me when I put this cursor on this level right here, where there are, those two lines are actually touching, up to 17,660 feet, which is indicated on the left, 
those two lines are basically touching all the way. You have a really, really deep layer of moisture. And I want to be at that temperature of minus 10. And it happens to be minus 11 where that um, air gets drier. Perfect place to put an aircraft right there. It would be a great day for cloud seeding yesterday afternoon in Edmonton. So you have to have that thick layer of moisture down there. So when the seed happens, the droplets start accumulating on each other and they fall through a nice moist layer and just accumulate and drop a whole bunch of rainfall. That's the thinking be before that aircraft actually goes out. You have to have the right temperature and clouds at that temperature and below, below them. So does that answer the question there, Liz? Yeah, so if you're on the ground, you're gonna see pretty thick clouds, right? Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. you have to have, you can't create uh, cloud seeding from, from scratch. You have to wait for the natural conditions to come in where you have that thick layer of moisture and then you go just before it gets to you, to the area that you wanna seed. You wait for that area to come in, you time it, and you go up and you fly around for two or three hours. Okay. So if you're on the ground with the thick clouds, you're never going to see the cloud seeding plane. Just That's correct. By you'll, your hear you'll, you'll hear them, though. I know. Mm -hmm. um, like Kat, she uh, was underneath the planes on occasion when the planes that I was watching down in Sonora this year. So they were at ten or 12,000 feet. You can hear them fly over at that at that level without a problem. I mean, we hear the jets at 30,000, 35,000. So you know they're uh -huh. up there. And if they're doing repetitious circles every 15 minutes or coming back over your house, you know you're on that flight path. Oh, okay. But the so, cloud seeding, they're not doing that with jets, right? No, not with jets. So this is the type of aircraft you'd be looking at. This is the one up in Red Deer that was uh flying like a i don't know i've never seen a pattern like that in in california it circles down here uh they have a different method up up near calgary apparently huh. uh, like in sonora it's just a perfect circle they just do 10 20 laps depending on how good the conditions are katie do you still have a question is your hand is still up do you still have a question uh, yes, I do. Uh, so all those clouds that you were talking about, Jeff, was it nine or 10 categories? So those are all naturally occurring things that we should see in the sky. None of those are geoengineering, right? That's correct. I, I did not get there. There are additional ones that will show that there is, well, contrails are what is the one I did, did not show yet. So that's the geoengineering one that's certainly there. Uh, I'm also going to show um, wave clouds, but those aren't geoengineered as well. Those are uh, natural clouds, mountain wave clouds. But yes, everything else that you saw, those are all natural clouds. Okay. And there is- Thank you. Thank okay, you. great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So my first question, I have several questions, but my first question is, tell, please tell what happened in Calgary that you were referring to. Oh, okay. Well, I might actually still have, uh, yeah, you had some pretty bad weather there. Uh, terrible hail. I mean, when you look at some of these videos, Big hail, huge damage on the west side of the houses. There, that's just a thick layer of hail right there. That was I mean, yesterday? When you, this oh. was yesterday, yes. <laughs> if you look yeah. at the sides of the houses, they got pelted. I mean, it was, sorry about that. I want to try to get rid of that. So so what is your, um, how, wh wh why was that? Can you explain that? Um. Well. Yes. That man caused or? Yes. Um, further into the, into the, um, when I get to the part two, after I get past the clouds, just showing you the, the, the last of the clouds, um, 
we get into the processes of what causes that. So what you have, what, what happens is, this is a satellite picture from Calgary's right here, dead center. Mm -hmm. And if you just went four hours earlier before, this is 5 p.m. as that's getting to Calgary. Mm -hmm. At 1 p.m., you have all this moisture uh, over all those mountains that you have up there. So lift causes cooling. Mm -hmm. If you push a wind that has moisture into up a slope, you can, as long as it cools, it's going to drop the moisture. It's going to form a cloud. And if you keep on lifting it and cooling it, it's going to um, rain. So if you just start uh, watching this thing as I go, I'll click through like an hour at a time, you can see this area to the west of Calgary. You can see these clouds forming and getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And they're becoming cumulonimbus at this point, which is that uh, type three low cloud or type nine low cloud. And as you continue to raise it over the hills, if that air is unstable, you can see the shadows of these guys. The sun is really low at 5.40 PM. So you're seeing the shadows to the west of the clouds or to the east of the clouds. So like right here over Calgary, you got this massive cumulonimbus cloud right at 6 30 p.m with a humongous shadow that's probably 10 miles across i don't know the exact scale to that but and that continued to go through you lose the sun shadow right there because the sun goes down you can see the darkness coming in from the east mm -hmm. so what it just was is unstable wet air getting lifted up those mountain slopes and getting pushed right over calgary and when I look at that windy profile showing the winds, those clouds or the wind speeds are 20 or 30 knots throughout this area. That barb means a westerly wind. Mm -hmm. This one is 27, 25 knots. Mm -hmm. When you just put your cursor on a line and windy, it tells you the speed and the direction it was coming from. In this case, at 18,000 feet, which is like the middle of those clouds, they go up to the tropopause is right here up at minus 49 degrees and then it starts to warm that's the stratosphere because that's the ozone absorbing all the uh, ultraviolet light that's coming through that starts to warm there this is the tropopause and that's a very stable place the clouds will go up to that like a thunderstorm and spread out so in in this case um those clouds are going up to 30 or 40,000 feet, 35,000 or thereabouts, and then they're spreading out. But that's a really unstable area. And I looked at uh, the temperature that was required a little bit earlier. There's something called the convective condensation level. This chart helps you figure out the level that the clouds are gonna form. So you need 16 degree temperature and it exceeded that, like it hit 23 yesterday. So when I, without telling you the mechanics of that right here, um, that area to the right of the red line is called a positive energy, energy area. That means the clouds are gonna go up to where, where it intersects the red line. So we're talking right there, minus 50 degrees, about 36,000 feet because of that heating and the lifting combined those two things got those um, storms to where they got stronger and stronger into the day as the sun was out and even as they left the mountains going down into the into the plains i guess you call it right it's just like uh like montana it yeah. drops down from the mountains down in the plains um, you still had the heat, so they persisted. So Any were there actually planes then in there do, causing this to rain, or are you just saying this is a natural thing? Um, there were planes. There were two. Yeah. Okay. But, okay, so there's a guy in the group, uh, Joe. Uh, what, what, is it Tundra Agora? Joe, you're not here, are you? Joe Tundra. No, he's not Joe here. Joe Tundra. Anymore. So 
he was saying that he saw somewhere that they were trying to head this off by trying to seed it to make it rain out. They were mm-hmm. way, 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 way late for that. Mm-hmm. So um, there was one more aircraft that was there as well. And those guys were absolutely nuts to be there because when you look at um, where that was, those Kimmel and Nimbus clouds were right here. And this guy was just ahead of it. It's like putting their cloud seeds into it, but it's already there. That damage was already happening. Those guys were doing absolutely crazy work if that was the case. But if they were cloud seeding the cloud seed and their meteorologist said, go out and do that with that stuff that was coming that brought that kind of hail. I mean, those guys should be in deep doo-doo if that's the case. Well, they should be in Top Gun not? 3. Why aren't they? What, what, why, why is nobody, you know, if this is the case and they caused this, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, they didn't cause that. Okay. So that was coming. You could see yeah. it for hours. I showed you on the, uh, on that, um, satellite picture mm-hmm. at one o'clock PM, they were kind of small. There was nothing really organized. But if you look here too, you could see these black lines. These are the wind flows. When everything comes together in one place, Mm -hmm. there is only one direction for the clouds to go up and that's up. Mm -hmm. They have to come together. They can't go down. So that wind flow where it converges has to go up. And if that air is unstable, you get what happened. Just lifting over that, over that ground plus the combination of the heat of the day. Um, and you couldn't have stopped that from happening with anything. No. So, so they were in more danger than, than they were, those, those guys were absolutely crazy. If you ask me, <laughs> Right. I mean, there, I had one photo that I shared in chat earlier and it was, it was the, the first guy right here. It was this one superimposed with the, the, cumulonimbus cloud was right there and then he dropped down did some low circles down here wherever this uh mazeppa or alder side he dropped down low and then zoomed out ahead back to red deer where he came from he was going around it to stay ahead of it to get back to his home base and the other aircraft i see if i can find that the other aircraft was um uh where are you flight radar uh i'm not going to find it quickly but he did something equally crazy i mean those guys were heroes to be out there if they were trying to do that if they were trying to uh stop that from happening which they couldn't have done Mm -hmm. okay Question, Jeff. Um, so you, you're showing stuff from flight, uh, flight radar. Is that like an app? Is that something we could use to track flights over us? Yes, you exactly. So like um, I have this set right now. It's over Calgary and this is the current you, uh... radar. I could zoom in a little bit to where you could see those, that's the rain showers. These are the red intensity, like, like you've seen on, on the news, when you get to the red, that's your heavier showers. The light green is your light rain. So that is something, I, I get the gold membership. So I have access to um, any of these aircraft. And like, this is the other guy yesterday. I just figured out how to, how to find it really quickly. This was the other guy yesterday. I can look at one year of his flights. And the cool thing about this is like, this is uh, yesterday. Okay, he got up at 4.30 this morning. He landed at 2.06 a.m. Um, that would be uniform time zone. And he left two hours later. He probably had to ground himself. And what he did was, um, let me find that flight yesterday. He was south of Calgary doing all these loops north of, north of Calgary and he continued down. He was doing all these loops south. And then all of a sudden, when I look at this um, 
altitude chart right here. I got to scroll that up. He did a beeline for Calgary. So here's, this is showing his flight level. So he's doing 192 knots. So he ascended rapidly, got up to 20,000 feet, 18,900. Then he went a little ways. Then he dropped lower, probably finding that minus 10 degree area. He was at 17,900. And then very right here, he dropped down at 151.53. He went beeline for, for Calgary, straight line. He was doing drunken sailor stuff until that. And he went, boom. He saw that stuff coming. It's like, I better land right now. Or he could have found another airport to the east, I suppose. But for whatever reason, he wanted to go there. And this shows all that aircraft's flights for a year and where he was, the times that he took off. Uh, like here's a, a four hour and 16 minute flight right down here. So he probably did, well, he went a long ways. Uh, went, so if you, so I'm assuming like a, you said you had like a platinum membership or something. Does that mean like a paid membership? Yes. And then do you ever see planes that you can't track? Just because I've heard from people online that they have like apps and they try to track people and some of them are untrackable. But if you have yes. a paid membership, can you generally see if somebody's near you? Um, this one is going to have some flights that are masked. I know of two that um, there's one called ADSB. It's, it's a really good one. I know um, there are some people that like it a lot. ADSB.com, I think it is. I'm looking at that right now. ADSBexchange.com. I put it in the chat. So if you look at it, so ADSBexchange.com. So that one, products and services. Oh, let's see. ADSB, I want to exchange. Yeah, I didn't have that right. ADSB exchange. Yeah. It has some good features too, but the thing I like about Flight Radar 24 is it gives you, it gives you um, that that trace, and it gives you a good history. You can get that that track trace on this guy, but I don't have a way. I don't think there is a premium membership, so you could probably do that here as well. But I mean, this is kind of cool in that it gives you a aircraft count wherever you are, whatever's on that screen, it gives you a count. You can put in um, filters, just like the other one. The other one would do the same thing. So like if I wanted to say here, 40,000 feet and up. So 40,000 to up above that, that will, uh, I can't put a comma in there, four zero 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 zero. Right, number of zeros, that's 4,000. That's the aircraft that are at 40,000 feet and above. And if you went and looked at the whole United States, for instance, I mentioned, I pulled a number out of the air earlier, but 50 above in the stratosphere. And that's 122, but the stratosphere is probably a little higher, more like 45,000. Those are the business, that's the business jet flight level where the elites go um there's only 28 of those right now the entire state oh and some of these are balloons these are high altitude balloons so adsb is excellent as well and if you click on an aircraft it'll show you its flight path as well but i don't have that one year of history that you can get with the gold membership on Flight Radar 24. I like Flight Radar 24 a little bit better. Some people like this one. But you know, that when you click on that aircraft, it gives you all the specifics on the left side about that aircraft. 455 knots, 45,000 feet, vertical rate of climb 64 or climb or descent. Right now it's zero heading 262.8 degrees, so it's heading west. Um, all the specifics are here about that aircraft. 
And this guy right here started down by San Diego, Los Angeles. This guy right here started up in Wisconsin. That guy right there, somewhere over in that Delmarva area. I don't know that exactly somewhere in that area, but you can zoom in and find. I, I like Flight Radar 24 better myself, but this is excellent as well. And um, my understanding is there is a military mode on this. I think if you click on the U, you only get military or no, um, might be backwards on that. Let's see. Yeah, that's the only military flight right now. So that's kind of a quick, nice feature. But if you go to Ventures or not Ventures Guy, Flight Radar 24, you have all these filters that you can build in. Like if I click that screen right there, it gets rid of that thing right there. And then there's filters that you can set for whatever you want. Like I had King Air and 15 to 21,000 feet earlier to find those aircraft that were in that sweet spot temperature. So right now, if I just click on 30 to 35,000 feet, I have a filter set to where, um, here we go, it's zooming out. There, you don't get the count unless you go to playback mode. If you go to playback mode, you can say the start time and you can start playback and it'll give you a count 748 in view right there. If I drag that screen farther over to get Canada and the US, 835 flights between 30 and 35,000 feet. And you can see the shadows coming in, showing the darkness coming from the east. And you can actually go back in time right there, back to any time you want, and you'll get the count at that time. So superb tools for um, figuring things out. I mean, right now, like if I were looking for um, Cirrus from uh, Contrails, mm -hmm. you would, this would be your verification method of the height of that aircraft. I would go to, okay. I should just stop for a second and say, are there any questions? I'm, are, are there any questions from flight radar? Before I move on to something else. Could I just ask a quick question about the, um, the Calgary incident? Because so many of us are trying to figure out our weather has changed. Like we can't even believe what's going on. And so we're sort of looking for causes and you just sort of pointed out a cause there where you said that, okay, this was a natural occurrence. It was coming in, it was going to hail anyway, but then there were these planes there. Like, can you, <laughs> what was their role in the severity of that storm? Minimal. Minimal. If, okay. if, if they did anything, I would be surprised. I mean, they were trying to make it hail Didn't out. Stop it. Is that what you said? Yeah, you couldn't stop that. that yeah. I mean, those, those cumulonimbus were 10, 20 miles across. Yeah. Once you got that going with the heat and that mountain, there's you couldn't stop that with anything. No, no, okay. So yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's very difficult to be able to um, figure. Out, I mean, <laughs> of course, it's terribly, terribly difficult to figure it all out. Okay, thank you for your expertise in figuring it. Uh, you know, giving us this information. But the the next the the other question that I had was, how do you tell the difference between? I'm glad you didn't include the fake clouds. And how do you tell the difference between, I think you called them bumpy clouds mm -hmm. or the harp clouds? Okay. So that one that gets talked about the most is called um, Lee waves, gravity waves. Mm -hmm. I actually have macro skies. Thank you. <laughs> um, what, what are some other names? Yeah, gravity waves, mountain waves, lee clouds. So I wanna go back to, um, let me jump to the International Cloud Atlas and go there live instead of going back to that PowerPoint. International 
Cloud Atlas. So let's think of a couple pictures of them, but they're lined up. So people think that they're harp, but you can easily come up with meteorological conditions for them that um, that cause them. Okay. So, so like, okay, mountain waves. Here we go. I don't know. Oh, that's a definition. It's not an actual cloud. Um, it's a little uh, bit lacking with images, this website, I feel. Yeah, you would think it would be a little bit stronger on that. Mm, mm. Okay, so this shows how it happens. So what you have to have for a mountain wave is you're, you're forcing moist air up to the top of the mountain. You have to have stable air aloft. That's downward moving air always heats. So you end up with uh, a situation of cold air under warming air. That's called an inversion. Mm -hmm. So let's see if this actually shows moist air forced to rise, unstable air aloft. So mountain waves are parallel lines of clouds parallel to that mountain chain. So they'd be running north south right here, for instance, if we were looking into that picture right there. Okay, so they're lines. And what what that does is the air rises, condenses because it cools, the temperature equals the dew point, and then because of an inversion, I don't know if they have a good picture here. Cloud base, here we go. Okay, so these are mountain wave pictures right here. Orographic is a term called well, orographic means topography um, based. So it's a it's a rise, it's a mountain or a hill that causes it. So as you push the wind up the windward side of the mountain and it condenses on the way up and then on the way down, it starts warming because descending air warms, you get lines of clouds and it's not gonna actually show any good mountain wave pictures? Maybe they are here. Let's see. Well, there they are. There mm -hmm. we go. You could see it in the satellite mm -hmm. really, really easily. They're just parallel lines. You have a north south mountain chain running here at the letter A. And the wind is coming in from the west, pushing it towards the east. And because of the upward and downward moving air. This kind of shows it right here. So it's going up the mountain and it, when it descends, the cloud dissipates mm -hmm. because it's warming. And then it turns back upwards because now it's warmer than uh, the surrounding air. This is, this is all stuff that I'm gonna be covering really well in a, another forthcoming video that Stella and I are gonna do. Descending air warms and it melts the cloud. It evaporates. When it comes back up, it hits the inversion again, gets turned downwards again. And as it goes up, it forms a cloud. You have a line of clouds. As it goes down, you have a line of no cloud. Back up, line of clouds. So you have that undulating type of a situation where you have cloud, no cloud, cloud, no cloud. That's not from HARP. Okay. Can I interject for just one moment, please? Yep. I think something that was really helpful to me was one day when Jim Lee said to me, just think of it like the water, like think of the sky, like the water, because it basically is. I mean, it's all vapor. It's a vapor canopy. Um, so if you look at the way water moves with ripples, etc., or wind blowing across the water, or even sand, if you want to look at it that way as well, the same sort of thing, ripple effects, etc. So once that went click in my head. It was like, oh, of course. It's just, I mean, it's going to react the same kind of way. So that really sort of helped me understand how things are formed. And yeah, I mean, they're bloody troublemakers, those alto cumulus, because everybody thinks they're harp, you know, they're not. I mean, I've had them right above my house. They're beautiful. I really appreciate them now. I used to get angry at them, but not anymore. Thank you, <laughs> Jeff. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the other thing is with harp, uh, you also um, 
maybe you should understand that HARP is ionospheric heaters. So when you look at the cloud, at the layer, not the cloud layers, but the layers around the earth, the ionosphere is way up high. So, and we're talking about the clouds in the troposphere. So ionospheric heaters are way, way, way up high. So we, we won't even see anything that's, that is related okay. to HARP. It is the, the space weather modification. It's considered space weather modification. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, any other? Any go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, there was a couple of little things I wanted to point out. I was just thinking about those two pilots at Calgary. It's like, it's almost like Tom Cruise and his supposed non existent stunt double just needed work, you know. But um, I did notice there was a few lee waves around that area too. That when you were showing it um, around to the southwest, south uh, oh. west, yeah, Calgary sort of area. But um, just just humour me for a moment. Like those two planes that were seen before this heavy storm, now, it doesn't make sense that they created the storm because when you start understanding this stuff and it's in perspective, there's no. It's like a drop in the ocean. Basically, there's no way they could do something that powerful on such a big area, right? Is that what you're saying, Jeff? Yeah. It, it, it was going to rain no matter what. I mean, you could see yeah. it in the radar. I mean, like when you look, let me go back to Venture Sky and go to the radar. Okay. But uh, point being that, that they probably wouldn't have been able to do that. So the fact that, you, like you said, they're pretty crazy for being there, like right in front of a front sort of thing. So I'm just wondering, humor me for a moment, are they trying to make it look like they have the power? Like, are they yes. getting up there and doing this to make it, us think that they can actually create this and squabble amongst each other, continue the, you know, division, et cetera. Whereas they, they know damn well, they can't do it. It could be an experiment, but is it also a mask? You know, I mean, it's always multifaceted. Anyway, just putting that out there. I think that's a great point because, you know, if you can get a nice money stream going to go flying, <laughs> go have a lunch and go, Go fly in some clouds. I don't know. Well, it is psychological I, warfare. I mean, we, we're in a propaganda war, so they're going to take advantage of every single thing that they can to have power over us, and the, the power is over our minds. So, you know, if they can't power the – if they can't have power over the weather, they can have power over our minds. I mean, it's like silent weapons for quiet wars, you know. I was wondering if we could um, – and this is a question actually that is going towards David here in our group – um, could we um, kind of um, send out or file an access request and see why and when and what what they the, what they were doing to these um, airlines? David, what do you think? What's your, what's your thought on that? Yeah, and um, an access request could get done to Transport Canada probably um, with respect to uh, probably finding out if there are any government approved flights in the area um if they're private um you may have to well if they're private aircraft uh, like WestJet or Air Canada I don't think they're going to be involved in very much but um yeah you can do an access request to Transport Canada and um they'll tell you for sure about any government um airplanes or government contracted airplanes that may have been in the area and why they were there um, specifics are important though. Um, if you tell them you want something from January 1st to July 1st, well, you're going to get billions of pages of information and, and it'll run you hundreds of thousands of bucks, right? But if you can minimize the time period and the location, uh, it'll be easier for them to get the information and significantly cheaper, of course, as well. Great. Awesome. Consider it done. <laughs> I will file this for sure. Cool. That'd be interesting to see what they come back with. Yeah. And with uh, with your help, uh, Jeff, then we can identify the uh, the, the situation, uh, the aircrafts, and then we can hopefully get an answer and see what's go what happened there. Awesome. Beautiful. I can give you the name of those two, the numbers, the tail numbers. They're okay. in chat. In fact, I put both of them in chat at uh, right. CV it. chat. Yeah. Was okay. that one of the ones where the, uh, the actual image was incorrect? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. The image was incorrect, and but the tail number likely was correct. 
Okay. All right. We'll figure it out and then we'll send in the uh, an access request to Transport Canada. Beautiful. Okay. Troy, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, just two quick things. Um, so Alberta, um, we know that um, there's a company there called Weather Modification Inc. And so can you track any of those planes to that company? And yes. uh, my second point would be, I'm not denying that there was rain coming or whatever, but could their um, cloud seeding with silver iodine, iodide, um, couldn't that have created bigger hail? Um, because we know that uh, the moisture sticks to, sticks to that, um, could, couldn't they have increased the storm? I suppose that's not impossible, but they say, according to what Joe said, that he saw somewhere, Joe Tundra Agora in our CV chat, he said, and I haven't seen this, we'd have to ask him where he saw that, but um, that they were trying to head it off and minimize it too late. I, I can't imagine though, two pounds of silver iodide or whatever it was while they were doing their their flights ahead of that storm i can't say it wouldn't be detrimental i mean it's designed to help make it fall out right so yeah well i, I just know from my research that um uh, they've been modifying the weather for over 100 years and that they, they still can't prove the efficacy of of modifying the weather right so it's kind of a, a crapshoot when you when you go up there and you try to do it and that's why that's why we're in the situation that we're in, I think. I'd say that sounds totally totally legit. Yeah, sort of on that subject, actually, if I can ask, um, I had a question, Jeff. Uh, so you've got the correct heights and dew points for silver iodide. If they're using something else, like maybe calcium carbonate or some other salt or whatever. Does it then require a different elevation and a different dew point? Does that vary expect, where the cloud seeding would take place? Or I, I would expect yes. I haven't seen what those specs are, though. So yes, though, I would think. Mm. I've only seen that one place. It's called ice iceflares.com, I believe it is. And they, at one point, had their spec sheets there they're no longer there. 404 and, error, is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, why? I think somebody maybe was poking around a little bit with them and they didn't like it. I know somebody that was actually making phone calls to them and mm -hmm. they were very evasive. And shortly after that, I think it was that those charts disappeared. But I remembered the range and somewhere in my disorganized files, I actually have that data and it was minus five to minus 10 is that range where they're looking for. And time and time and time again, that's where they show up. I just wait for the rain to start coming in. And I say, I know that's the area they're gonna be in. And I get the height based on the temperature. And sure enough, they're within a thousand feet of that every time. That's really easy to predict. Uh, they show up at the right time, at the right altitude, just based on using Venture Sky to get a temperature and a, mm -hmm. a radar radar picture showing it coming in. So I don't even look down in California this time of year that freezing levels up at such a high height and we have no clouds, so you couldn't you couldn't force cloud seeding for any cost where it's dry like that. You don't have, mm. you have to have that deep layer of moisture. Canada has that right now. So does Australia. But I yeah, don't know. It could, if have been a little, it could have been a little sort of an experiment that they were running, I guess, just sort of see what happens while this massive thing is coming that they already know about. Possibly. <laughs> I would have steered clear of that. That's for sure. Now they might get blame. Good danger money. <laughs> Every man has his price. Uh, <laughs> expensive flight i i did see a receipt one time for the cost of a month of the guy down in sonora and that was weather modification it was a very very high price for the five flights they did that month or it might have been six flights i actually saw an invoice 
and it was in the tens of thousands of dollars for those five flights. They make a lot of money doing this. Oh, yeah. It's a big industry. I have a, a couple questions. One question is, um, so looking at like Flight Radar 24 and the other, the other app, so you talked about how flights can be masked. And I know from a pilot friend who has worked for private industry and that they can mask flights. So um, what you were just talking about there about the invoice, like how much are they making? Whoever is doing this, right? Uh, wouldn't they just have the resources to always do it where we can't track it? Or is it just that it would be more expensive if they put it out of tracking distance? Like, what? how come we can see some of this, but we can't see all of it? I think ADSB and Skyglass, it's either Skyglass or Spyglass. They say that they can't mask on Skyglass. That's a really cool app. ADSB is really hard too because the way ADSB is set up, it's not, I don't believe it's, um, I don't think there has to be a transponder on the aircraft. Somehow there's ways to detect it from the people on the ground that participate in ADSB. So those are the two least likely to be able to um, mask. I mean, you can, with Skyglass, you can track Bill Gates, you can track anybody. There's nobody that's above being tracked by that, supposedly. Well, that's exciting. The sky glass. Sky glass. It's really cool. It's a pretty high learning curve. It's 3D. It's got the best look of any of these. It's um, a lot of bells and whistles to it, but there's a high learning curve and there's a cost. And I don't think it's a lot, though. But um, that may be the best for all that. I mean, you'll see fighters on that sometimes. I looked at it a few times. I play with it. But the ease of use of, of Flight Radar 24 is my, makes it my favorite. ADSB, I think, is better than Flight Radar 24 for stopping the um, masking. Okay. Uh, my other question is just about patterns. Like I will notice, say go, I go on Facebook and a bunch of people in my area are posting pictures that day of crazy lines in the sky. And then I'll also see on Twitter that that seems to be happening in the UK. Does there, do you track any sort of patterns where they seem to be doing, you know, something at certain times globally, or is it, uh, just like more individual geographical areas that they seem to be doing things? Has anyone noticed any patterns like that? Well, I know the days that you see heavy contrails, you have something called, <clears throat> have you ever heard the terminology ISSR? No. I super saturated region. If you look at the satellite picture right here, this shows the cloud top temperatures. <clears throat> so I'm looking at California right now and to the southwest of San Francisco there's an area that has blue down here lower left corner with the whites so that is tracking up towards us right now towards California and if you look down the desert southwest Utah Arizona there's a lot of convection happening there and I can tell you that that's thunderstorms because, well, let me look at Windy real quick as well. If I go to Windy and you go to Weather Radar, then you can see, uh, where am I here? Okay, I'm up in Canada yet. Okay, so Desert Southwest, whole bunch of rain showers, thunderstorms, and it even shows the lightning and you can probably hear it if you listen to the app right here. So. When I go back to the radar or the uh, satellite, <clears throat> I'm looking for minus 40 degrees when I'm looking for contrails. But as I've learned in my process of the last year and a half from, from Jim Lee at Climate Viewer, it's like all aircraft fuel 
is dirty fuel. It has all the heavy metals that we see, uh, aluminum, barium, strontium. It has all that stuff in it. So does it matter if you're leaving a contrail or not? I mean, what I can do here is find the areas that are appropriate for contrails, but the truth is every aircraft, while that engine is on, is putting nasty stuff into the air and we get it no matter you can see the contrail or not. It's become moot. So uh, occasionally though, you'll see an area like what we got coming from the Southwest, that's gonna result in a lot of contrails tomorrow. Might even be there right now because if you look like, I'll zoom in a little bit, there's a little patch up by Reno. There, this temperature scale down below, bright white is close to minus 40. It's about minus 42. Where it turns to blue is minus 45. That's the sweet spot. So you would look right there at the edge of all of these cloud bands. Uh, and I'll say the edges because if you fly into a thick cloud, your contrail is just going to become a part of the cloud. You're not going to see it. It just adds to the moisture that's already there. But at the edges is where you could usually find them. So I would look at this with another view. This is called um, upper level tropospheric moisture water vapor. That's what this one is. That helps me find the edges of those white areas. Then I would go down to this thing called split window difference grayscale. And we'll see if there are any today. I looked briefly this morning and let's see this thing load. And we could see possible contrails. Again, that's kind of moot because no matter what, whether you see the contrail or not, we're still getting all the effluents that are the impurities that were not refined out of the, out of the jet fuel. Let me refresh this here. It's not going so quick. Okay, I wanna be impatient and do it again. Here we go. So what you have is what I call dirty afternoon sky. When you have all the convection and it pushes all that surface into the upper layers, it gets really hard to see contrails. The morning one is a lot better. So like, as I look up into Canada, um, those are mountains. That's all clouds topping the mountains. If I go to the Southwest, it's just all blurted out with all that moisture. If I go to the edge of uh, up in Montana, maybe nothing there. I can't see a single contrail. So if I go to say goes east, which covers the Eastern half of the United States, maybe I'll find something there. But when you get one of those ISSR zones, ice super saturated region, you can't miss the contrails. It just becomes a blend of X's and O's and asterisks and all those scary patterns that they have out there. <laughs> you see people talking about tic-tac-toes. There's a app that, uh, while I'm waiting for that to come up, I'm gonna quickly go to this app and show you, it's really quite cool how you can see how you get the X's and O's contrail simulations. Yes, this is it. So this is a website from a guy by the name of Mick West. And it shows a east-west jet route. So every single line, there's jet highways, right? Um, jets fly, follow specific routes between specific cities. Very specific, very exact, you know. 33,000 feet going in one direction, 34,000 coming the other way, 1,000 feet of separation. North, south, same thing. So if you have one guy going left, right, east, west, and another guy going north, south, and the winds are, these are adjustable things that you can adjust right here. Um, right now I have plane speed of five, 478 miles per hour, or knots, yeah, miles per hour. Wind speed of 44, and 
wind heading direction of 59 degrees from, from the northeast. That's what your sky is going to look like if you just have two lines of aircrafts passing. And th that's assuming a very um, uh, equal spacing of time between jets passing that point. So it's rarely going to be that perfect. But like if I were to slow down the speed and change the wind direction, the wind speed, and change the wind direction, you get to simulate what it will look like based on the conditions that are happening right now. And I can get that wind speed and direction from windy going to radius on data and picking, let's say, Flagstaff or anywhere I can get the wind speed and direction right there at 35,000 feet, for instance, I know seven knots out of 150. But if I were to go to uh, a place where the jet stream is stronger, somewhere up north, I'm gonna say up in Canada right now, uh, this location right here is Edmonton again. No, that's Candy Lake. The winds are out of the Southwest at, uh, I can't read it. Why is that? Oh, it's funky how that, okay. I can't read the numbers, but that pennant is 50. The short line is five and a long line is 10. So 53 knots, you can get the speeds right here. So you could plug those into that calculator basically right from the radius on sounding from either the morning sounding, they were released at zero UTC and 12 UTC for a lot of stations. Some stations only do one sounding a day, but plug those in and it'll paint you a picture of if you had a equal spacing of planes passing that same jet route, that's geoengineering accidental if you're in that moist enough, cold enough zone, then you can have the contrail. And what that requires though, is you could see up here where that temperature and that dew point line, they're very close together. And in Celsius, you have to, um, I'm gonna widen this out a little bit. That'd be why I can't see this. So there's a four degree spread right there, three degree. 24 and 21 negatives. So at 21 though, you're not gonna get the contrail. You need like minus 40, minus 35 at a minimum. So you actually have to go higher. You have to go higher up to find that um, colder temperature. And I'm having trouble controlling this here. It's not even that cold. There we go, minus 40. So if you have a five degree spread or less and you have a minus say 35, um, you can have a contrail. That's at 31,000 feet over Candle Lake, Canada. And the winds are all the Southwest at about 70 miles per hour, 59, mile, 59 knots. And the thing is though, from 23,911 feet, when that radius on passed through and up above this point right here, that balloon went up to 100,000 feet before it popped and it gave information to that to us up to that point. But this chart doesn't show it all. It stops here at 35,000 for this location. So, there's clouds from here at around 24,000 up to the tropopause probably at Winnipeg at the time of this sounding, which was 1800 Zulu. That's pretty uncommon to see a 1800 Zulu sounding. Zulu is just another name for UTC, which is, Stella, help me. Universal coordinated time. Thank you. <laughs> I always get that wrong. <clears throat> so 
because that layer of clouds is so thick, you wouldn't see a contrail on that. You would need to see a thinner layer that might only be two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet thick instead of 20,000 feet thick. It's such a thick layer of clouds, the contrail would just blend in and become a part of it. I'm not quite sure how I actually got to that point. What was, um, am I deviating from the question a little bit there? I don't think so. Was well, there even a question? <laughs> I'm blathering out on and on and on. It's like, mm -hmm. shut up once in a while, Jeff, and ask questions. <laughs> Troy, you've got your hand up. Go right ahead. Yeah, so um, from what I've learned, there's something called the Appleman chart, and the military used that Appleman chart to um, yes. not cause contrails in the sky, so then the enemy couldn't see where they were flying. Um, I'm kind of going around in a circle here back to the clouds that we were talking about at the beginning the last cloud that you spoke about showed the halo around the sun i i thought that was caused by the contrails by the chemicals in the jet fuel am i mistaken in that or is that another cloud altogether every ice crystal is a prism so every prism creates a rainbow ice ice crystal layer like that is due to the it doesn't need metals you know a rainbow going through small droplets in the sky is just from the uh the breaking apart just like a prism so i can't say that the metals wouldn't affect that color a little bit if it was a dense layer of metals <clears throat> that can have a part in it but you don't you don't need anything those cirrus clouds were produced you know um they were produced at weather fronts and wherever there's convection like um you go take a look at the pacific ocean right now the weather fronts are what pushes the cirrus into the upper atmosphere um there's a little thing right here called clouds and it's got choices right here and if you want to just see the high clouds those are the areas where the high clouds are right now and it's going to tell you where they're going to be tomorrow or the day after and if you have high clouds you have the possibility of contrails because that moisture is already there and they're forecasting it to be visible so i could go to the eighth you get less accuracy as time goes on, but just using this app alone, I can tell you where those high clouds are. And at a very minimum, like if I look to the east, if I look at the periphery of that cloud shield, um, you might just see the little pokies coming out of it. Every yes, little. So I'm, I'm in Nova Scotia. And so we've got a hurricane coming up the coast right now. It hit Florida the other day. It's in, um, uh, the Carolinas, I think, right now, and so mm -hmm. it's they're talking about it coming. It's on all over the news and all over the radio every time I turn it on. And they're talking about the potential for this storm. It hit Florida at a cat one, and they're saying that it they don't know what it's going to do. But typically, hurricanes historically, when they hit land, would dissipate and lose their strength. But it seems like now, uh, like Fiona hit us a few years back, and Fiona crossed over it. It turned 90 degrees, it turned again, and it seemed to gain strength as it hit the land. And so I'm wondering if you know anything about, if you have any knowledge about hurricanes and if you can put any insight into what's what's going on, like hurricane season is upon us. And that's, that's the big thing on the East Coast right now. As far as people steering them, I would never seen the technology and wouldn't believe that it could happen okay. myself. This right here, this particular app, you can go to wind speed right here, 250 meters above the ground, any height you want. How about 10 meters above the ground? That's the forecast location on the 8th. On the 9th, uh, it dissipates. There's no circulation center. It's gone. So I think this thing's going to fall apart. 
there's Debbie right there over North Carolina. And if I just push that play button, it's going to show you where they're forecasting it to go with this particular app. And just zoom out to the 9th, to the 10th. There's no circulation center. So you got some pretty good strong winds out there, 30 knot winds, but no circle. We had, um, I'm in Virginia Beach and we had like pretty re heavy rain on the beach, but then driving one hour inland, there was no rain at all. Today? I don't know if that, <laughs> yeah, today, today, heavy rainstorm on the beach okay. at Virginia Beach. There's there's the radar from today. Uh-huh. Now, let's see. Uh, there's Richmond. Virginia Beach is probably somewhere on the beach, I'm guessing. It's south south Correct. of Richmond. There, there it is. Okay. So at uh, what time was it raining? Um, like one one o'clock. Uh, two two you no, know, after one o'clock. Like let me see. So 2 p.m. Two or three. Okay, so that's what the forecast mm -hmm. was for the precipitation huh? right there. And the actual, if you hit radar, so according to that, it should have been raining then, but this yeah. is what really happened. Um, doesn't look like much at all at, oh, I'm I'm at the wrong time. For some reason, I don't know why this is, Maybe because I didn't refresh this for a while. It cuts off at 11 a.m. Uh -oh. At 11 a.m. it was there. Oh. If I refreshed it, it probably would. Well, it's moot. It's showing 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. It was arriving in Virginia Beach. Uh, yeah, it didn't oh, raining until after lunch. The reason why is because you're four hours ahead of my time. This is based on Pacific time. Oh, OK. So it's getting yeah. there at 2 p.m., 3, no, 1 p.m. at yeah. three hours, 1 p.m. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that, that's a part of, okay, so that circulation center is right there. And yes, all those clouds are associated with that storm itself. Uh -huh. That's very clear. Satellite will show you the same thing. It's a south flow. You got a counterclockwise rotation around that center of Debbie. Lows have counterclockwise rotation. So on the east side, the winds are out of the south. You got the warm Atlantic pushing all that moisture up towards you and raining on you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But then it just rained at the beach. And then when we went inland, it didn't even rain. Yeah. Well, you were. <laughs> Well, in time, all that moisture is going inland. If you just use this precip forecast right here and play okay. that guy out, you could just click click through it three hours at a time yeah. and see it's going to push inland as well. Okay. But can I just the, can I say something there? Yeah. It's awesome if you guys can all learn how to use these apps. I'm still learning myself as well um, because, as we know, they – the they weather people, <laughs> TM, yeah. they're lying constantly. Like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't listen to them because sometimes they actually tell the truth. But the thing is, is that if there's, this is what they're doing in, I'm in Australia, obviously. Um, and this is what they do all the time. Like up in Queensland, you know, time after time in the last cyclone season that they were building it up. It's like, oh, it's going to be really bad. And then it would sort of, you know, you could almost hear their disappointment when it's kind of blew itself out and, oh, it's rebuilding again. Be very, be afraid. You know? <laughs> so it's really awesome if we could all, you know, learn how to read these apps ourselves because we don't need those dudes anymore. You know, we can just look at this stuff and figure it out for ourselves, probably a lot more accurately than they ever could. So, you know, and besides weather, people always end up pregnant for some reason. I don't get that. There's always weather women. They're always pregnant. <laughs> What's with that? Something in the air. <laughs> Cloud seeding to the extreme. I don't know. So back to your um, original question, Nova Scotia. I forgot your name. I'm sorry. 
That was Troy. Troy. Yeah. So you get a lot of rain coming, but there's no circulation center, but you still have, if you could go to this, you can get your wind speed, you can get um, your expected precipitation. That's that link right there, that tab that I've picked. Radar would show you what actual is. Clouds show you what total cloud cover will look like. And satellite will show you it's actual. And then you got your wind speeds at any height that you want. It gives this this app is quite incredible actually. So you really don't need a weather person anymore. No, no, I really appreciate that. I have been using the uh, the windy app. Um, yes. But this one, this one seems uh, like it has a lot more options on it. Wendy's wonderful, and I like it mainly because of the radio sound data. And that's so critical to anybody that's into weather. You have every station right there is, if you click on that little weather balloon right there, it says radio sounds. Every one of those is going to tell you what the picture of that atmosphere looked like at that moment in time when that thing flew up to 100,000 feet over two hours. Uh, they, you, they, you, they can rise you show up. that again? I've never seen that on the app. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll get back to the blank screen right there. So there's a little balloon right down there. Bottom See right it? corner. The bottom right corner. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And if it doesn't show up, just go to the three dots and scroll down and put radio sounds and pin it to the home page. Perfect. And then when you click on, let's say here, St. Paul, Minneapolis, you could see from this that there's a area of, of five degree spread right there down at 5,700 feet, possible cloud right there. Here's uh, a one degree spread looking at for less than five degrees up at 24,000 feet and that moisture kind of drops off, you get a bigger spread for a while, and then it comes back together right there at 34,000. So if there's an aircraft at 34,000 with a three degree temperature dew point spread, you might be seeing a contrail. You should be seeing a contrail unless the clouds were so thick that you absorb it. In this case, they're not very thick because right down below that, it's a nine degree spread right above it it's huge. That's a 24 degree spread right there. So you got one little area over St. Paul, Minnesota, where you might get a contrail. And you could check that with going back to your, um, your satellite. And I don't know if I finished looking at uh, the East Coast. I was waiting for that to load, I think. And it still hasn't loaded. I don't know what's going on. Let me try it again. Okay, looks like it might be trying to come here this time. That's one thing I didn't finish that I was trying to look for. So we have a possibility of seeing some contrails, but again, to me, contrails are moot with the exception of they do trap some heat. They're not totally moot. Um, let me refresh that again because when it gets like that with the big letters it's not working the nice thing about this particular thing it's infrared so it's measuring the temperatures it works at night as well so if you see a that one of those big zones where you have the tic-tac-toes and everything above you and they're spreading out to form cirrus this night photo right here with this split window difference grayscale will show you the contrails. Okay, so here we go. There's your hurricane right there. What in the world? That's not right. Maybe oh. if you uh, close a few tabs that you're not using, Jeff, that might help. That might, but what my problem here is I have archived imagery set up right there from around the time of the event yesterday in, uh, in uh, Calgary. So. Here we go. Okay, so now you have 
looking for contrails. I don't see a single one. And you can look all over the world very quickly. In five minutes, you can scan the whole world for an ISSR zone. You could go to Australia. That's a geocompsat. You could go to Himawari covering Japan. Here's your Australian picture right here. So this is called RAMB, R-A-M-M-B slider dot Sira. Here's your, uh, there you go. Sydney's got a whole bunch of contrails right now. Can you see me Major waving? League. I see you. Wait, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a little farther up. Look at that. You have contrails all over southern part of Australia. So excellent. You could go, you could go there right now, and I have another tab for that. This right here is University of Wyoming, and you could pick any continent. So let's say South Pacific, and look at Sydney right here. Okay. Oh, I did the wrong thing. I want to show a. I want to show the graphic. That's Sydney, right? S S M S. It's really selected. Wagga Wagga. That sound right, Stella? Yeah, Wagga Wagga. Okay, so where I, I mean, is my where's my tab? Oh, I don't. It's not coming. It come. It's not coming in. Is that it right there? There it is. So, right up there. It's really tight right there at about 11,000 meters. You have a very tight temperature dew point spread. That explains it. You have a perfect situation there where you have only some low clouds down below up to about, uh, that's kind of hard to read, but 1,562 meters. The moisture drops off to the left and then it's no closer than a 10 degree spread at any point in here. And this stuff will all come up on another radius on class that Stella and I are gonna be doing. So I'm not gonna to get too into it right now. Just know that five degrees where it pinches in is where your clouds are likely. So you have a big window from the ground up to see those clouds up there in Sydney and south of that. And there's quite a few. That's the ISSR. That whole that whole sky right now is getting quite um, covered up. Up by okay. Sydney too. Not up by Brisbane yet. You you should see them soon though. Uh, okay. So, any questions about any of that? I'm just, I just quickly um, let everybody know why we call them contrails, because all of them are contrails. So those are condensation trails. Uh, and that's because of the condensation that's happening when the when an, a jet engine burns the fuel. And um, the reason why we call them chemtrails is because of what is added to the jet fuel. So we briefly touched this as well here. The, uh, additives like aluminum, barium, strontium, and then there's certainly soot. And that all creates what we call chemtrails. So contrails are chemtrails and chemtrails are contrails because every contrail has to condensate on something. And those are the additives in the jet fuel. But there are also natural dust particles as well. So you don't have to have but you do have, no matter what, you have it. It's in the jet fuel. You have the condensation nuclei. So I'm not disputing what you said there. I'm just trying to add to that. So it could be naturally there as well from whatever, whatever um, dust producing events, Sahara desert dust or whatever that gets it into the atmosphere, upper atmosphere by convection. So there's yeah. Europe right there for anybody from Europe. You can see like there's a low pressure center up to the northeast, northwest of Dublin. And I just saw a contrail. Here we come. 
just to the left of, of uh, Ireland, you can see them starting to show up right there. And if you were to go to that other um, temperature scale that I showed you, which is, oh, they don't, they don't have it named the same thing there. You have to go to band six, 6.25 micrometer. And you'll see that uh, it's, you're gonna be near that white area on that temperature scale. So that this particular one is good for finding those areas where it's near minus 40. And that's just before it turns blue and the bright white. So if you're looking for contrails, that's how you locate it. And then you go to the split window difference. So here you can see, there they are. There's one right there, poking out of the side of that cirrus shield. See that one right there? Okay, back it up, right there. That's a contrail. And the reason why it's happening right there is because, well, there's one down here too. Sometimes you can see them if the layer is not too thick they'll show up, or if that aircraft is right above it, the satellite sees it, if it's right above the cloud layer. But poking out of the side, um, think of it like this. The cloud stops when the temperature dew point conditions are not quite right to show a cloud. But if you fly a jet into that with some big engines and you pump a bunch of moisture there, now you just brought the dew point up to equal the temperature. Now you have a cloud there because you just added more moisture. So that's why it's easy, if anywhere, to find them on the edges, even when the clouds are super, super thick. And that's the chart to use to find them. 6.25 micrometer, close to minus 40 degrees Celsius. And sometimes you'll see them up higher into that bright white pushing minus 45 and Troy, I think it was, or somebody mentioned the Appleman chart. I don't know if that'll show up right now. If I, I have to look for it here and it might, let's see, it might not show up. Appleman chart, Appleman. I might have to close that um, where, Appleman, low bypass, high bypass. Can you see that Appleman chart? Or do I have to change the screen over? Can anybody see that? We're uh -oh. looking, no, we're looking at the oh. cloud. Okay, uh, so I need to stop the share and Ram share. Are we looking at? At the moment. Okay, I'll, I'm going to stop the share quickly and change the screen share to the Appleman chart and share that. So here's the Appleman chart. So what you do, you got a low bypass aircraft, which is the older style aircraft engine, and you got the high bypass. So what you do is take the uh, data from your um, skew t, which is the radius on data, and 250 millibars is dead center of the flight stratum between 30 and 40,000 feet. That's your cruising altitudes. So you get the temperature, let's say it's minus 40, that's the bottom scale, and line that up with the 250. And it tells you, you need 75% humidity to see a contrail. And like if it was 300 millibars, most aircraft don't fly that low. They don't cruise that low. It's usually higher, sometimes at 200. If it was minus 50 degrees and 200 millibars, right at the tropopause, somewhere right near the base of the stratosphere, at that point, with minus 50 at 40,000 feet, there's the 10% line. That's the 40% line. About 20 or 25% humidity is all you need to see a jet trail. So 
you, here's the extreme. You could have minus 55 at 200 millibars. And there's the yes zone on the left and the no zone on the right. And you're gonna have a contrail no matter what moisture there is up there. You don't need any ambient moisture to get a contrail. And that would be what they call the ephemerals. It dissipates in 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds, it's gone. No ambient humidity required at 50 degrees, 55 degrees below. And on the other end of the extremes, let's say at 300 millibars, which is about 30,000 feet, if it was only 35 degrees below, you need about 90% humidity. That's how the Appleman works. Any questions about that? Not on my end. <laughs> Is there anybody else with a question? I did, but I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should have written it down. Well, then, I mean, I, I would like to thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're getting close to the eight o'clock mark here. And it's been two hours that we have been on this uh, call. If there is anybody else with a with a question, please come forward. Just uh, you know, ask your question. If not, then uh, is there anything else, Jeff, you would like to add? I remember it. You remember it? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just while we're quickly on the, on the subject of this, um, can you please just briefly explain, Jeff, why it is that uh, some people send in photos and things, what have you, and it's like a contrail that turns off and on. They keep saying that, oh, they're turning the taps on and off, you know. Um, is it? Can you explain the atmospheric conditions that makes that happen so that when we're seeing dotted lines instead of straight lines? Okay, right here. Contrails. If this aircraft over... Where is this? Doesn't matter where it is. Minnesota, St. Paul. There's a thin layer of less than five degrees. If that aircraft was going up to thirty-five thousand, we're still looking at the Apple Man chart. Is that oh, right? Oh, yeah. I gotta stop. <laughs> hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> I gotta change that over again to screen share of of. Firefox. Okay. How's that? Much better. Okay. So we're looking at the, the skew T log P diagram again, the temperature and dew point in Minneapolis. There's a three degree spread right at 34,000 feet. If, if there was an aircraft ascending at 3,000 feet per minute on his way to 40,000 feet, you're going to get a brief slanted contrail right there. And why? It's only going to show up where it's under five degrees. And a little ways above, it's 13 degrees spread. And a little ways below, it's nine degrees spread. So figure a, a climb rate of about two or 3,000 feet per minute for most aircraft, faster for Learjets and things like that. So it depends what they're flying through. And it's got to be, again, minus 35 at a minimum to get a contrail. If he's going through a wet area and then a dry area and then a wet area and then a dry area as it's ascending, or if it's descending, figure at 450 knots or thereabouts, um, they're gonna cover, I think I calculated it out, eight miles a minute, eight, eight, nine, 10 miles a minute, depending on the speed. So you might have a 1,000 foot thick area where there's enough moisture and temperature conditions where, where the conditions are just right as he's passing through that slope line, going through that area, it's on off, on off. Depends on the moisture temperatures. Yeah, like a ripple effect sort of thing of the air type thing. Because it is very hard to tell how high planes are just by looking with the naked eye, isn't it? I mean, some people will say, well, those two planes, are, are you know, they look about the same, but that one's giving off a trail and that one's not. And it's like, well, you don't realize that they could be 4,000 feet apart or whatever, but they look like maybe they're very similar height. Exactly. 
I mean, that's where you have to have this. Yep. You need to have flight radar to confirm that what the radius on data showed, you know that there might be a 5,000 foot thick layer. And then you look at that aircraft flying through it. And that aircraft is at 31,975 feet. And you could see that aircraft from your house. Um, you just confirmed what the radius on data showed that at that level, there should be a contrail. If the conditions are right, based on Appleman, now you have your way to check it. You need the three things. You need the satellite or your eyes. You need the flight radar data for the confirmation. Satellite is a bonus. Um, what else? Those, those are the things that are critical. Anybody that sends me a picture of a contrail without a location and a time, uh, there's no way to collaborate that, that there should be a contrail there. And if there shouldn't be, that's a chemtrail by process of elimination. Does that make sense? And if there should be a contrail and there's not, then you can blame HARP. <laughs> 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 okay and on that positive note is there anybody <laughs> anybody else and i saw your hand up is there is there still something else you would like to ask another day another time thank you so much for this it's been really informative i appreciate it thanks yeah, you're more than welcome. Wonderful. Okay, we're getting to, like I say, it's eight o'clock our time. It's probably, well, it's three hours ahead in the, in the east part of our country. Uh, so there is a few people here from Ontario um, and some from Australia. They are one day ahead. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of fun. Um, yeah, if there is uh, nothing else, then I would like to um, open the floor for just a, I don't know, a brief chat, ch chit chat, if, if you still would like to ch uh, chat, then I would like to uh, also then stop the recording because if, if there is anything, nothing else um, as well from on Jeff's end, uh, you would like to add, then I can stop the recording. Is there anything else, Jeff? Go ahead, go right ahead. If there's something you would like to add. I think I over talked already. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've used about 50 million words. I never talked that long. Um, if I may, I did put a link into the chat for the show that Jeff and I do. It's on my channel. It's just under Stella Q at this point. Um, but that's a link for the podcast. That's the weather. Um, we've only done three so far. The fourth one's due out either probably around about tomorrow or the next day, maybe even later today. We'll see. Wonderful. Yes, that's amazing. Yes, thank you so much, Stella. That's much appreciated. And I shared your weather or the light already in our Substack as well. So, um, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's what we are here for. So, um, I know that there is a counselor here uh, in our uh, chat group here on, on our Zoom call, Lisa from Ontario, and she obviously wants to um, address the geoengineering in the uh, her well in her area and city council um lisa there is so much more to know about geoengineering so this was a was a presentation about the weather and how it does still occur so we still have weather happening <laughs> so we can't change that which is good but we do have certainly the bad part of uh what's also happening in our skies and not just in our skies but everywhere else and this is called geoengineering and that implies the word geo which means earth um so i would like to invite you to a, a call um and um kind of a presentation about geoengineering a little bit in a nutshell to tell you a bit more about what is geoengineering what are the technologies of uh, geoengineering and what they do and how they I don't know how they affect us. So if that's uh, a possibility and an option for you, then I would like to invite you for a presentation in that regard. 
so that you can tackle your city council <laughs> and ask the right question. And by the way, Troy, tell us a little bit about your uh, meeting with your, um, who was that? Was it a city council as well? Oh, I met with um, with Sean Fraser. He's the uh, minister of was he housing now? He's my uh, he's my local representative, and uh, I had a meeting with him and gave him a presentation about uh, geoengineering. And um, still waiting to hear back from him. There you go. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the challenge, right? Uh, they never get back to us. Anyway, so. Yeah, if there's nothing else, uh, then I then stop the recording and.